Good afternoon from New York City to all our viewers in North America, Europe, Romania, and anywhere in the world. Thank you for watching a new edition of the Ferraro Conferences Online, one of our permanent programs that puts front and center people and topics relevant to the Romanian-American cultural relations. Our guest today is the charismatic, eloquent, indefatigable Will Evans, the founder and uh, publisher of uh, Deep Vell. Will Evans is a um, visionary cultural entrepreneur running one of the most successful institutions in the American cultural life. He is a brilliant publisher who created uh, Deep Vellum and uh, in less than 10 years, transformed it into a powerhouse of the American publishing world, the biggest press for literary translations in the United States. Will is a great friend of uh, Romania, the publisher of uh, Mircea Cărtărescu and uh, Magda Kirnec, and a uh, extraordinary valuable partner of the Romanian Cultural Institute, we uh, planned and organized together one of the biggest um, uh, projects dedicated to a Romanian author or Romanian book um, in recent memory, Mircea Cărtărescu's uh, highly successful American tour, uh, a series of uh, launching events uh, devoted to um, Solenoid, published by uh, Deep Vellum a book that was um, awarded the prestigious LA Times Prize for Fiction just a few uh, weeks ago. Will Evans, welcome to the program. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, again, we have so much that we've been working on together. It's such a joy to be here with you. They said you were crazy to pursue your dream of creating um, a press devoted to translations in a time of, of upheaval, in a difficult time for the publishing world. And yet you proved everybody wrong. Um, it was, uh, did, not only did you survive, but you also thrived. And it was a miracle that you um, created in less than uh, 10 years um, by numbers, the biggest, um, the biggest press for translations in the United States. You have um, in your portfolio around 2,000 uh, titles, uh, fantastic authors from all over the world. How do you explain this fantastic achievement? What's wow. the secret of it? You know, Dorian, I'm not going to tell you all the secrets. It's like the secret <laughs> sauce or the KFC, you know, they have the secret ingredients that go into the chicken. But uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. And, and the first off is like, uh, first off, none of this would be possible without uh, readers. Like, uh, and we have, I consider myself a reader, first and foremost. All the job titles are things that you've said that are very nice about me. I'm a reader. I'm very and, true. Foremost. <laughs> and, and And I grew up in a world in the United States in which I was starving my entire life for something more. And the something more is a certain type of literature. And a lot of times it's literature from outside the borders of my country written in languages I don't understand. And literature is a way for me to sort of engage the world. I grew up never traveling. I had never left America till, till I went off to university and studied abroad. And this opportunity for me to meet other people, to meet other cultures, to see different ways of constructing stories and literary art it just comes from my lifelong love of being a reader, right? I've been a reader since my mom sat me on her lap as a child and read to me from the earliest age. And so first and foremost, I thank my mom for making this possible. Um, and then to this day where any success that we have is because when we sign on a book to publish and then we host events for books that we publish and other authors events, the whole goal is to bring more readers into the party. People who feel like they're a part of literary culture and people who maybe don't, right? I grew up in North Carolina. I now live in Dallas, Texas, not exactly literary hotspots on the international circuit, but they're filled with people, amazing people, smart people, people who want that kind of literary culture. And so, uh, you know, even though everybody said I was crazy to start Deep Vellum 10 years ago, um, it feels every day like 
they're still trying to keep us out. You know, the whole world is set up so that this thing doesn't succeed. It's set up so you don't publish creatively risky projects. It's set up so that readers in Dallas and North Carolina get used to growing up in a city that doesn't have independent bookstores, in a place that you can't find books from Romania, or you can't find books from Mexico, or you can't find books by authors from Dallas or Wilmington, North Carolina, where I grew up. And people are okay with that. I'm not okay with that. And so that's the beginning of our secret is this mentality that there's something missing and we got to go find it and platform it and bring people to the party to join it with us. And in that mentality, whether it's a book by Magda Karnic or Mirta Kaczorescu, or it's a book by writers from Dallas or from Russia or Mexico or anywhere in between, the whole goal is to bring people in and show them something new. And we are always seeking that something. Uh, and, and that drive is, is like as if we support readers first and foremost. And of course, we support writers. We publish them. We, we make this whole thing happen. But if we put readers first, I think that that may be a little bit of what differentiates us from some other folks. It's a mentality thing, right, first off. And to be in a city like Dallas, and you see this little map, when I moved to the place where this little shining beacon is up there, there were no independent bookstores here 10 years ago. No literary publishing houses. I'm not okay with that, Dorian. And so that's when we set out to do something. Well, I, I, I can tell that you have transformed the, the place. And um, we're going to talk about um, what Dallas has become in, uh, in literary terms uh, shortly. But before that, of course, these 10 years were very, very intense. Uh, I mean, um, even though you, you, you sound it was easy, as if it, if it, if it was easy, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and like a, like a pleasure trip, uh, these ha have been, you know, intense, uh, complicated years. You came, uh, uh, Deep Vellum was founded in a time of, um, of um, accelerated change. Uh, people around you uh, try to dissuade you in, in, uh, in going on with, uh, with this idea to create a, uh, a uh, publishing house. But st still, you know, it, um, there, there must be, there must be um, something, something more than the burning desire to publish book. There must be something else. Uh, and I would, uh, I, I would suppose it's uh, um, a flair. It's um, um, a vast knowledge of literature. You write, you have always been an avid, uh, avid reader. You, uh, you studied uh, literature at, uh, at Duke. Uh, and, and in other places, and uh, uh, and it must be leadership. Uh, do you have a uh, leadership mantra? Uh, <laughs> how do you define this? Everybody, I mean, you have a lot of followers. You know, you have you have a fantastic board. Uh, you know, you have um, you know, investors and donors. Everybody following you. What's what's the secret? Ah, uh, that's a great question, and. There's a lot of questions buried within that. And so the, the first thing is like, whatever kind of leader I am, I, I could be better at it every day. And so this idea that every day, I'm not ever content with my role in the organization or our success. And I think, you know, our team members, people always ask, like, how do you do so much of development? And I'm like, because it's not just me. If I'm on this call right now, it means that there's dozens of people working on projects around me to help this thing happen. And the ability to sit on this, is a, it's a privilege and a joy to be able to share some of what we do so that hopefully people who don't know Deep Vellum can hear something about it, or people who already know us from the work we've done with one or two books could learn a little more, um, and to see behind the curtains of publishing. Because publishing is a very secretive industry, especially in America, and most publishing in this country happens on that island that you're sitting on right now, right? Over 80% of the books published in America every year come out of Manhattan. Right. And out of that, most of them come from five publishing houses with their hundreds, if not thousands of imprints. Right. You got the big five in America. And once upon a time, it was good business for the big five to publish commercial whatever garbage. And then they would also have their literary works and they would publish adventurous international literary titles, avant garde, super historical, super topical, but very diverse. Um, and in the past several decades, especially over the last four decades, they've gotten away from it completely as they've all become bigger and bigger companies. And now there's only five. And so you have those companies that used to do all this great work doing much and much, much, much less interesting international work. And so if you want to look at the very 
basic business proposal that Deep Vellum started with. It was that there's something missing and that it could be good business to focus on that high quality literary canon that is missing. Untranslated texts, texts that have gone out of print. Uh, and by focusing on international, we're able to work with authors who are on another tier, right? And I studied Russian literature at Duke, right? And, and undergrad at Emory. And when I studied Russian literature, one of the things they teach you there is essentially that you, the intelligentsia, authors are on another tier. They speak truth to power. They're communicating directly with the muse. And then what comes out? These artistic products are, are perfect. They may be imperfect, but they are perfect artistic product. And that you are able to ingest them and process them and engage with them as a reader on a deep level. That's the mentality that started with me. And then you apply that to a bit of an entrepreneurial streak. I looked around in 2012 and said, there's definitely something missing. The, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times said that books are dead. Ebooks are the future. Bookstores are never coming back. No one's ever going to read again. They were saying this as if there was any grain of truth in it. Just because ebook sales were going up, it doesn't mean that people are going to stop reading. Are you kidding me? And the same people who read ebooks are the ones who used to go read dime store novels. You know, they read one genre at a time. There's always a place for books, but more importantly, there's a place for literature in whatever medium people want to read it in digital, print, audio, I don't know, whatever else may yet to come. And so in that mentality, my leadership at the beginning was to try to see a market opportunity in art, in literary art, because we're in the business of taking art and making it into a product. So you're the bridge between the art world and the commercial world. That's what publishing is. And you can do that from the mentality of the big five, which is owning the marketplace, owning the biggest authors, owning distribution, owning the printers. We can't do that. And so we fight from the bottom and say, listen to us, we're doing something different. If that's the value proposition of what publishing is and has been, we don't like it because there's so much missing and we've been missing from it. You've been missing from it. These authors have been missing from it. The readers of Dallas and the readers of the country, the readers of New York have been missing this. And if they're telling you that why wasn't Solenoid published the day it came out in Romania, it's not because Mirta Cartarescu is not an amazing author. It's because they're cowards. I tell you, Dorian, they're cowards. And it's, it's a shame. And it is a shame it has gotten to this point. But it is the way that it is. And so our mentality is to look around and say, as leaders, we want to be an organization that leads by trying to bring in more readers and trying to bring in authors and to make those connections. And if we can forge those bonds, there are business ways to do it. And there are reasons that we do it in Dallas, why we felt brave enough to start this thing here. And then to this day, we have amazing team members who lift the organization up every day, who carry it forth into the future with authors who are increasingly more successful, right? One success becomes a bigger success for everyone else. It lifts the entire list of books. And then at the same time, we live in a city that has multiple universities, tons of corporations, people moving here from all over the world at all times. One of the biggest airports in America with direct flights to many of the world's global capitals. We're in the middle, right? We're in the middle of everything. And yet there had never been an organization to look around and to do exactly what we do. There are literary people here. There are literary things happening in Dallas long before I got here. But my plan was to stand up and to shout and say, we can do this together and build something more. Right. And so we started using this term literary Dallas. And it sounds silly, literary Dallas, when you say it. Like it's either why would you say that? Or yeah, duh. Of course, it's not, it's not everywhere is literary as long as there's readers and writers. But we had the newspaper in Dallas do two things that are really funny with that. And one is that the uh, arts section of our newspaper, like every weekend edition, they would come out and they would tag any event that was profiling an author or an event or an organization in the city. They would tag it Literary Dallas in the headline. They started a Facebook group called Literary Dallas so that all of us readers and writers of the city, there's like 10,000 members of this group now. It's amazing. It's called Literary Dallas. So it worked. And then at the same time, last year, when we created a poet laureate program with the library and with the city's uh, Office of Arts and Culture, the city newspaper ran an official editorial the official editorial board op-ed and said, Will Evans says Dallas is a literary city. We don't agree. It is a business city. It's a can-do city. And as if those two things have to be different. It can be a business city. Everywhere is a business city, but it's also a literary city. And they think that it's not because the mentality of Dallas is that it's only business. It's only commerce. As if what we do is not business. As if literary, literature is not business. As if arts are not also business. And Andy Warhol has a great quote about art and business being very interlinked. So again, my secret of leadership is not 
it, it, it's it's any number of things. And my team is probably asking for more leadership on a day to day basis. My board probably <laughs> wants more leadership on a day to day basis. My authors want more leadership. But at the same time, the goal is to stand up and say that we're all in this together. And if you're buying into Deep Elm, you're buying into a whole conceptual project. And that conceptual project is really unique in American publishing. Um, and it's one of the things that differentiates us from our peers who publish amazing books too. And what we've tried to do in Dallas by having a bookstore in addition to publishing is about making sure that we don't do it alone. And so that we can't publish every book. And if you have a great book, we'll host your event in our bookstore too. We'll sell your book, right? Like, and if you're a writer who wants to be published, come on in and learn the ropes. So you have, um, uh, together with your team and your partners, uh, you have transformed uh, Dallas, as you, as you uh, have explained, um, into um, a, a, literary, a literary hub. Um, how important was that you have at, uh, in the University of uh, Dallas, you have an important uh, trans, uh, translating, um, translating institute, uh, one that has uh, devoted a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge and, and energy to, um, to growing the next generations of, um, uh, of translators. Uh, it's great you brought up the university. So I have to say it's the University of Texas at uh, Dallas is the one you uh, mean. University of Texas we, at Dallas. Yeah, we have we have three major universities in Dallas, and one is University of Dallas, which is a it's like a Catholic private university. Another is called SMU, Southern Methodist University, uh, and it is uh, another private liberal arts college. And then there's University of Texas at Dallas, which is a mm -hmm. a, a state run uh, institution. And they're all very different from each other with really amazing students and faculty and different resources and different goals and different ways they engage with the city. But uh, what's interesting, they all have the, you know, none of them are in the city of Dallas, Dorian. So this is something that separates us. It's like having New York University, but it's in Hoboken. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's oh, like yeah. having the University yeah. of New York, but it's not in New York City. It would be, yeah. uh, again, in like uh, in a whole other place. And so, of course, they're all within the greater metropolitan yeah, Dallas, sure. but they're like, again, the city of Dallas and the idea of Dallas are two very different things. But when it, when, it's no secret, too, that my very first business plan for Deep Bellum, uh, when I was living in North Carolina and looking at Dallas from afar with binoculars, like, well, how can I do this there? Looking at resources, doing all my research about what kind of business I would found, how's it going to go? I said, University of Texas at Dallas has a translation center. And it was founded about 40 or 50 years ago by a guy named Reiner Schulte. And I said, I think Deep Bellum should be a part of that center. And our very first business plan went to the University of Texas in Dallas, and it went up to the, to the dean's office. And eventually they said no. And I said, okay, you're in law. <laughs> what a bummer. Well, the you know? first no's yeah. in a long line of no's, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> and, and look, I, my wife, who is integral to the success of Deep Bellum, She's a lawyer in town, but when we, we started dating, we lived in Los Angeles and she worked for a film producer. And producing a film is a lot like publishing a book because you're the one who puts the whole thing together. You work with everybody. You work with the director, you work with the actors, you work with the money people, you make the whole schedule work, you work with marketing, you do the distribution, everything. The producer is a lot like a publisher in that way. And this producer had never worked for a studio, which is again, a lot like being an independent publisher. You're trying to work outside the system and crack in and get as many people as you can to the party. And he said, no is the second best answer in Hollywood. <laughs> I was like, and I remember he said that a long time ago. And I was like, that makes total sense because it, it's, it's yes or no. And maybe is the worst or when you're waiting for things. Yes is great, but no is the second best because you could move on. And I said, great, UTD doesn't want it. Well, those people are still here. And one of those people that you mentioned is the great Sean Cotter, who is one of the best translators of Romanian into English of all time. Yeah. He happened to be in Dallas. And right around the time I was moving here, he had two books come out, translated from Romanian uh, by Archipelago Books, the great Brooklyn-based publisher. And he, uh, the books were Cartorescu's Blinding and Nikita Stinescu's uh, Wheel with Single Spoke. Those two books came out, and they're two of the best books I've ever read. I, it was like an incredible moment to be able to say, I live in the same city as this guy. Like, this is a thing we can do. And so around that time, I was just looking to meet everybody in the city. And you heard the story. Forgive me, Dorian. I'm going to repeat myself. But yeah, so I love it all the time. One of the first events Deep Vellum ever organized was at a house in East Dallas that was like owned. I don't know. It wasn't even owned. It was like a bunch of artistic former English majors were living in this house. 
And they were doing a poetry reading series. And when I first moved here, I went to a night where everyone there was reading Simborska, right? We're sitting around reading the poems. Someone read them in Polish. A bunch of people read them in English. We talked about it. There were professors and students and just people in their 20s and people in their 40s and people in their 70s. It was this really interesting group. And so I said, why don't we bring Sean Cotter into this group? And so Deep Vellum organized an event with Sean Cotter to read from Blinding and Wheel of Single Spoke at this house. But I then invited the very brand new bookstore, The Wild Detectives, in which was started by two guys from Spain who moved here as engineers to build bridges over our river. And they opened this bookstore because it was missing in the city. And we teamed up early on, did a lot together, but I invited them to come to the house and sell these books. So the very first book that the Wild Detectives ever sold was Blinding in cool. Dallas in 2014. Amazing. There, were, there was a first independent bookstore in Dallas selling new books in decades, like a huge transformative moment. And it was in a house and it was Romanian literature, and it was a deep vellum, right? A publishing literary nonprofit and a bookstore. And then, but the most important thing were those readers. Those readers were already there. They never would have chosen Blinding or Wheel of Single Spoke for the reading series, but then when presented with it, they were obsessed. They were able to read this book because of Sean, who's here. It's what it takes for this all to work is all the different facets of a literary community. And first and foremost, they're the readers. And you can't blame a reader for not knowing everything in a society where you have a million books published That's every right. year. Yeah. And so it takes some curation and it takes the community to be able to bring the opportunity to engage so that you can crack down the walls that exist between American literary culture and Romanian literary culture. And to say that translation, of course, becomes the bridge. Mm -hmm. And this like translation is like, how do you take the book and then present it to the reader in an era of Amazon's ubiquitous dominance how can you take something and offer the human scale connection right that's something the algorithm will never replace but here's a way to do it uh and that that was a really special moment and so when you came and you got to see Mircha at the wild detectives the reason we did that event is because of an entire decade oh, it's, it's, that went into that moment you know and that's why and how this works like we're not doing it alone so the university of texas at dallas the day after you flew home we took Mircha to the university and you have 100 people there. Half were from the community. They're from the city right around the university. But the other half were students and faculty and administrators. And it's, that's a big event at a university, right, for an author who's still relatively unknown in America. But you have him. And it was just such an amazing experience because at universities in our area, you're, you have to drive to them and then you have to park on their campus. And so most people don't ever go to the campuses in the area. And so to be able to bring the community to the university is very important. And this event did that in a special way. It's just that it was just everything clicking. But that university, University of Texas at Dallas, was the resource that I thought I could be brave and dumb enough to start developing because the translators are here. The future translators will be here and we'll be able to bring in the authors and the translators together. And so we often host events with that university in particular, UT Dallas. It's a great school and, and the student body is extraordinary. It's so diverse. Most of the students are first generation American or first generation college. And it's not structured like a traditional liberal arts university. So it offers some creativity to the programming and the flexibility of arts and engagement um, across disciplines. It's, it's a really unique place. And um, the leadership of the university is astounding. And like, we just always, always work with them. And so- but you, you, have, uh, you have this uh, fantastic gift in, um, in putting together huge coalitions of uh, friends and partners. And I think the success of uh, Deep Vellum owes a lot to this, um, this brilliant, uh, brilliant capacity to, um, to discern where the, the, the resources, maybe untapped resources are and uh, put it to, uh, to good work. You talked about uh, translators and I think it's very important in the success of Deep Vellum, the way you engaged uh, translators, not only the unique, great um, Sean Carter, but also other uh, translation, uh, translators throughout, the, uh, throughout America. Because you, uh, you have published uh, books from pretty much every language, uh, language in the world. So you, you were- We have a long yeah, way to go there, Dorian. Yeah, we do. yeah, still, still, still. Still, some way to go. But you, you worked with uh, you, you, you work with uh, with a lot of uh, translators. How important are the translators in your decision making process? How do you work with them on daily basis? Um, 
<clears throat> it's, it's no secret that translators are responsible for most of the success of Deep Vellum, right? Some of the very first books that we were presented uh, were, were presented to us by translators. It's almost like they're serving as agents and scouts and, you know, making recommendations all the time to us because, well, first off, there are so few translation publishers in English. So telling us what's out there, they might be able to get their work done, which is great. But that work is so invaluable. And when you find a translator who's actually on the same wavelength, like editorial mindset as you, it's incredible. There are translators out there. Uh, the first one, one of the first translators we ever worked with was a very young at the time translator who's now a very established translator named Emma Ramadan, who translates from French. And before I'd founded Deep Vellum, or right around the time I was about to found it, she said, you're going to start this press. You should publish a book called Sphinx by Angaretta. It was published in 1986. It's a genderless love story. OK, and then she goes and she's a, a member of the Ulipo. And I was like, oh, I know the Ulipo and I love them. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've read her stuff in anthologies before. And she goes, yeah, she's never had a book in English. And it was just like everything clicked. And after working with Emma on that book, her translation was astounding. But more than that, she would say, I want to translate this book. And she would tell me about it. And I go, I want to read that book. And just anything Emma wants to do, I want to do. Right. It, it, to find someone that you're so closely editorially respectful of her her knowledge and her intelligence is so much deeper than mine and that is the secret to deep vellum success too in that deep vellum is a project to confront my ignorance of the world you called me well read i'll never feel well read dorian i don't know anything like i know a little bit about russian literature but and and what little i know of russian literature i know much less of american literature i don't know anything i I still am learning about Romanian literature. I'm still learning about all the literatures of the world, but Deep Vellum is a way to do that. And we have books now from like 75 languages. That's our, yeah, 70, 75 languages. I think is the count that we're up to. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of languages. Words Without Borders, our good friends at Words Without Borders, one of the most amazing organizations. They publish like shorter pieces online and they've been doing it much longer than we have. They're celebrating an anniversary this year at like 20... 20 something years. They're just, they're the best. And they've done like 145 languages. So again, they, they're they the leaders. I look up to them. And so we're doing book sewing in terms of book publishing. It doesn't seem like another publisher has ever done 75 languages, not FSG, not Knopf, not Random House, um, not any of the other translation presses, no matter how many they've done, it's amazing. But like doing two languages is amazing. Doing 20 is astounding. Doing 75 is ridiculous. And, um, but it's all due to the translators. And so for us, there are books that translators bring us and we're like, yes. Um, usually we get really interested when a number of certain points happen. A book happens when we can not just get a good pitch, but we can also think of the ways that we could sell it the people we could partner with. Cause like we mentioned, putting it together is about so much more than just putting the book out there. It's not guaranteed to be a success for us or anyone thinking about the, how we could position it in the market. Does it fit where we are as an organization? Did we already do a book just like it? In which case, no, we're not going to do it because diversity for us is not just who writes the books and where it's from. It's also stylistic diversity and, and how the books. So it's a lot of, it. it's a lot of marketing going on into, in a final decision. Absolutely. And like artistic, you know, um, artistic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When, when, when we construct the list of how we present the books, it's like very integral to us. Like timing, timing really is everything. It and, should be a deep uh, vellum and, book, right? Before anything else. It should, yeah, uh, should it be a deep vellum book? And we have a couple other imprints. And then, um, so where, where do these books land? There's different imprints that serve different purposes. There are different editors involved now who do different things. But yeah, does our team want to do it, you know, increasingly getting more and more people involved. We've never had an editorial board or an editorial committee. We've never sent books to marketing committees before signing them, but we're increasingly doing that, which is something I'm like really wary of, to be totally honest, because there has to be some like pure, hard connection to the book. And you can, you can lose that sometimes when it gets filtered through a lot of voices. Um, but at the same time, our team really needs to be able to buy into every book the way I do. And this is no longer just me doing it like it was 10 years ago. I need everyone sure. to feel committed um, and to, that they feel they could bring books in too. Even if you're not an editor, if you have a friend who wrote a great book, tell us about it. Take some ownership, have some fun, like do it, do a thing. Um, because our, our team are all great readers and we all are interested in very different styles of books. And so Deep Vellum can't even serve all of us in our interests and that's okay, but we can learn from our staff as much as from our authors and authors make recommendations too. 
So sometimes it's like the author recommends a book. We know the translator who would work on it. Then we know someone we could partner with to present it. It could be the Romanian Cultural Institute, right? Oh, there's, we have a history. We know maybe this is the book. Maybe it's the Icelandic Literature Fund or, you know what I mean? Maybe it's, there's someone we could work with or in American literature. It's like we work with authors who don't write in translation. Maybe here's a way that we think the book will fit in the market. And um, it, we so, think so of the market, but people. we're not dominated by it, yeah. You have a lot of inputs, and I, I think um, I think it's still a um, a function of your um, skill, a function of your uh, of your size. Even though you have um, ag aggressively pursue a um, a program of development, you have uh, bought uh, presses, uh, similar presses maybe with very good uh, good titles uh, in the past years. You have grown exponentially, and probably, um, probably this is uh, the last uh, maybe the last years when we are <laughs> when you can uh, we can uh, play by this playbook uh, of uh, of having this um, uh, this more personalized relationship with your translators, uh, with your uh, with your uh, editors, um, and as you grow to become probably the sixth of the biggest in uh, in america uh, this all will uh, will be a um, a a beautiful memory of the uh, of the beginning but you you said something very important about being a business people as well being somebody who's paying attention to the business side you haven't you couldn't have been so successful had you not pay attention to this aspect the business aspect deep vellum is a fantastic cultural organization but at the same time is a successful business and um and um uh, but you at the beginning you you had the choice to um to found it as a as a company as any other company or as a nonprofit organization, why this choice? Why did you choose to go uh, ahead with a nonprofit? That's a great question. And so, for for any viewers who are in Romania or Europe, especially, it does. When you hear nonprofit, people laugh and they say, "Well, all publishing is nonprofit." So, ha ha ha. But it's a <laughs> it's a it's a uniquely American distinction of business operations that. Uh, is required by our tax law to do this kind of work. In many countries, Canada, UK, around the world, you can get grants from the government for private institutions to do the work of publishing and literature and promoting of literature. Um, it's very common, as we know, there's things like fixed book price laws in many countries that support the publishing industry. And in America, it's the Wild West, yeah. right? It is complete, there are no rules about publishing. And so as a result, you have these massive discount retailers you have publishers who make pennies on every book, but they publish millions of books. And so they make millions and it's, it's a whole ridiculous system. And so for us, when I made the choice about being a for-profit company, a traditional company or a nonprofit company, there's an important distinction. And, and that is that nonprofit companies are still companies, they're corporations, um, and that they have to operate under certain guidelines of tax rules to avoid the uh, taxation. So we don't pay taxes to the government on profits that we make because we don't make profits. We make excess revenue that is invested back into the mission, the mission of the organization. And it's the only way to get grants and donations in America uh, from the governments uh, or from individuals or from corporations. You have to be a nonprofit, right? Uh, and to set up as a for-profit entity in 2013, when I set up Deep Vellum, uh, we have a very famous investor in Dallas. His name is Mark Cuban, right? He's on TV all the time. He's on Shark Tank. So imagine I went to Mark Cuban with my Shark Tank proposal in 2013. And I was like, you may have read the news that books are dead. You may have read the news that less than 3% of the books are translated, but I'm going to disrupt the market and we're going to publish good books. And we're going to get people interested in them by just doing a very traditional thing, publishing books, holding on literary events and bringing people into a literary community. I would have been laughed out of the room. I would have been shown the curb so fast because why on earth would you invest in a new publishing venture when the industry was going through so much turmoil well, that you mentioned, when, when bookstores, the number of bookstores had been just diminishing so much, like why get involved in that market? And so to set up as a nonprofit though was really important. And I was doing a lot of research on this. Um, a lot of business schools in America, including Duke's business school, um, we're studying at the time something that's called social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It's about starting businesses that do good, 
And so there's two ways you can do that. One is starting a traditional nonprofit, but operating like a business under that structure. And then the other is to set up what's called like a B Corp. And this is maybe more like the European corporation model where you can get grants and donations and things, but you're also a for-profit venture. It's called, and, and there's, I think it's called an S Corp to the IRS. It's called a B Corp if you get a stamp of sustainability. All that to say, it does not exist in Texas, which is where we're based. And so it doesn't matter. I can't be one of those here anyways. There is no S Corp in Texas. So you're a nonprofit or you're a for-profit, nothing in between. So we decided we decided to be a nonprofit because it took the value proposition that we're offering. Mm-hmm. Every business offers a value proposition. And in our value proposition, it is saying that the literature and the what's missing and the diversity, the equity, the inclusivity, the community is what is most important, right? Sales are only an indicator of success if all those other things happen first. Mm-hmm. And so um, if we have a book sell a million copies, right? Like let's say Solenoid sells a million copies. The structure of our business is that I don't profit from it because I don't own Deep Vellum. I, de- I'm the pub- I run Deep Vellum, but Deep Vellum is owned by the state of Texas. The people of Texas own Deep Vellum. So that it's is a unique, non-profit. Yeah. that's what nonprofits are, right? And nonprofits in America include, you know, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, the, every university in America, um, or all the, yeah, most universities in America. Um, and, and so in Dallas, it's the symphony, it's the museum of art, it's the opera, it's the biggest theater production doing Broadway shows. These are nonprofits and they are buying and selling tickets for thousands of dollars for shows. And everyone's like, yay, nonprofit art. <laughs> we, we started, we started buying and selling books, you know, here you go. We're selling books as a way to support our mission. And people in Dallas are always like, you can't be a nonprofit. You sell books. <laughs> I'm like, what? Of course we could be a nonprofit. Like, there's yeah. other nonprofit the corporate publishers. structure is the tax system. That's the it, it's just a structure. And I was like, yeah, you. I mean, if you want me to be for profit, give me ten million dollars, and I'll go publish for profit books. And let me tell you, if I'm doing for profit books, I'm not doing as many Romanian literary titles. I'm not doing Moldovan poetry. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. if we're set up as a nonprofit, the value is to say that these books matter just as much as Prince Harry's fucking biography. Forget my language, right? Like that is a very traditional for-profit corporate presentation of a book. And do I think that book has any cultural value? I mean, not as a literary text. It's something as interesting as a historical document. And so, but there's 5 million copies of that sold. And what that means for us is a lot of things. It takes up table space at bookstores. It takes up readers' attention. It takes up paper at the printers. So it makes it harder for us to print books you have to think about the entire way all this stuff is linked. Mm -hmm. And so when we have a bookstore and a publishing house, we see it all, man. And so we look at what is really happening. To be a nonprofit is a way of saying there is so much more important about connecting readers and writers than selling them a book. The sale of a book is where everything begins for us, but it's also not the end for us, right? It's like somewhere in the middle where it's like we work to get to that point and then we do so much more past that point. And to sell a book, even the ones we don't publish, just comes right back into helping keep do this, keep doing this, keep doing this. So that in our bookstore, you walk in right now, and the, we have Magda's book, we have Mircea's books, we have the Dalki Archive books that they publish from Romania, like yes. Stepaneg and others. Sure. And then we also have other Romanian books that Seven Stories Press is publishing, right? Because we love that book or those books, and we love Seven Stories Press. And here's a way to platform the great work that they're doing in our space here in Dallas. And so. It all ties back together, but that's the nonprofit mentality. And if we're set up as a for-profit, I probably wouldn't be on this call with you today. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't be talking to me. I, I hope we always have this personal connection. And I will always come out and talk about the business and the realities of publishing because the business is still opaque and it's intentionally opaque so that readers don't understand the choices that go into the way they're presented literature. And that bums me out. And so I want to I want to do something about that. But uh, thankfully, the deep vellum books are now found in uh, all major uh, bookstores throughout the United States. Um, um, book launching events take place. Um, great reviews are published. Prizes are awarded. So it's a totally different uh, ball game. Uh, and, and you said prizes, Dorian. Hold on, I have this sitting right next to my desk. Uh, I don't know if you can see it because of uh, no, you can't see it because of my background. It was it's the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now we can see it. Yeah. Uh-huh. See it. See oh, it. Or, or, so uh, we. Oh yeah. Ah, come on, see it keeps disappearing. It's so funny. 
So yeah, um, beautiful. It's uh, and and that that uh, that brings me to um, our um, our fantastic partnership and collaboration. Um, we were all very proud of um, uh, of um, Mircea Cartarescu's uh, success. Um, uh, it was it was an amazing uh, an amazing adventure that culminated with um, uh, with the solenoid uh, being awarded this uh, very very prestigious um, uh, literary prize. Um, Tell us a little bit about your um, relationship with Romanian literature. How um, how do you pick up the authors? Um, how how do you feel about this uh, uh, this uh, literature? You know, what are your plans um, when it comes to um, uh, to Romanian literature if they can be revealed? So um, so let's talk about this uh, fantastic. Uh, a solenoid experience, and of course, uh, Magda uh, Magda Kurnetsch's book was also very uh, very well uh, well received. So, um, yeah, deep vellum and Romanian literature. So, I mean, I I don't know anything about Romanian literature, right, Dorian? I've only read a few books. I don't know the national literature of Romania. Do you know what I mean? And I, I rarely know the national literature of a place. And so, when we are getting interested in a title. Um, I remember the days when I would say, like, well, I mean, if you if you if I found out about a Romanian book, you kind of look at the list. Well, we don't have very many Romanian books. What a perfect time. And that moment for us really happened. Five years ago, six years ago, Sean Cotter is here in Dallas and we were having lunch at our favorite restaurant. We go to this Lebanese restaurant near his university and we've gone to lunch there a dozen times over the last 10 years. And we've had all these major events in our life. We've signed contracts there. I show him the book prize there. It's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful place. But um, especially that, for a diehard uh, vegan like yourself. Exactly. Yes. And so thankfully in Lebanese food, you know, it's like a perfect menu. So you, the meat eaters are happy and then the vegans yeah. are happy. It's just, it's a delightful yeah. place. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about Dallas is that. It you know, happens the with the Romanian, uh, rest, uh, Romanian cuisine as well. Right? Beautiful. I can't wait to, to visit, right? This is what I'm going to tell you. And so I like to try to remain humble. I don't know anything about Romanian literature. If I took a, I would need to take a Romanian literature class to understand how it all really works at the level of how Mircea understands Romanian literature, right? He's a true scholar. He knows how it works intimately. He knows that when he says one word, it's hearkening back 200 years to this. And when he says another word, it's about a poet that he was, you know, best friends with when they were in grammar school. And so that's, the beauty of how literature works. And I don't know that for Romanian. I know that pretty well for Russian compared to most Americans, but like in terms of how it works in Romania, I don't. But when Sean sat down and I had read Blinding in Sean's translation, and I had read Stonescu's Wheel of Single Spoke, and I had read Nostalgia, uh, that New Directions had published by Karcharescu, we sat down about five or six years ago and we made a plan to start doing more Romanian literature together. And Sean said, the first book I want to translate is Femme of Magda Carnage. And uh, and he told me a little bit about it. And I was like, OK, this is a perfect place to start. This book fits in to so many other books that we've published, right, by feminist writers of her generation who are doing something really unique with the stylistic presentation of the story. It's a very international story. It's the Scheherazade story, right, in the Romanian context, right, in Magda's poetic telling. So yeah, that's perfect. And Sean is a translator of poetry and fiction. So he has a great way of being able to translate the poetry of Magda's voice. And let's go. And so we started there and then I said, great, um, back at four years ago, we, we got brave enough to try to sign on Solenoid, which is, of course, as you know, a big book, <clears throat> quite yeah. an expensive uh, proposition. And so we signed it on and said, Sean, we're going to take a chance on this book and like, let's put you to work for as long as it takes. But this is a book that I am desperate to read because I had read Nostalgia and Blinding and I want this to be our way in. And so through Sean, I've learned a lot about Romanian literature because I go to his office and I see the texts on his walls about Romanian literature. They're in Romanian, they're in English, they're they're in German, talking about um, writers who I knew because I'd been reading a lot from other publishers. So of course I got to know the work of Norman Menea thanks to the work of New Directions and others. Um, and so you look at what is available. Uh, other publishers have done books by Sean in the meantime, including the great book Curl by Tio Bobe that's uh, that was done by Wakefield Press, such a fun, strange book, you know? And 
the thing about it is, again, I still don't know what the national literature of Romania is because Mircea and Magda and Bobe and Manea are like four completely different writers. Like they might as well be from four different moons. And uh, and then, of course, we've gotten to work with Emilian Galaifu Paun, who's a great Moldovan writer, writes in Romanian. And uh, Dolky Archive published a novel of his that's very avant-garde. Uh, and then we're working on a book of his poetry at Deep Vellum right now. And so you piece together things like for American readers, how can we contextualize for someone that Emilian might be from a place called Moldova, but he writes in Romanian and what that means, right? So that we're not just telling you to read a book, but that we're going to show it in Romanian. And there has to be a way to contextualize the book so that you can start to understand a bit of the context behind it. And so as we do that, we all learn more about the culture and the literatures and stuff like that. And so our relationship to Romanian literature is growing. Um, it, every day we're learning more and more um, since, since our wonderful success with Soul Night, but also Femme, which, yeah, got nominated for uh, right. the Pen, the Pen Translation Pen Prize, Translation. which is huge. It got extraordinary yeah. reviews. Yeah. Um, the, the goal has been to figure out how to do more Romanian literature so that we don't sort of let it go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And Sean is a great translator, but he's obviously not the only great translator of Romanian literature. How can we continue to work with um, additional translators, bring more translators into this great language? Because, you know, Romania as a country is smaller than this place I call home, right? But it has this literary tradition that's just so vast that it's still so much untapped, even as other publishers do work from there and we seek out kind of what's coming. And so our goal is to... to develop a partnership with the Romanian Cultural Institute to publish a couple books a year into the future and see what we can do to publish more books by Mircea, to publish more books by Magda, to publish more books by Emilian, to publish more books by writers whose names we haven't brought up yet as we continue to learn and grow and find those books that really speak to our mission and hopefully at the same time get other publishers interested in Romanian literature. Because like success isn't going to come from only Deep Bellum getting interested. If you could get Rare Bird, which is I'm wearing this shirt, this is a great Los Angeles publisher. If you could get Rare Bird to do a Romanian book, I mean, you're you're on another path, right? Like they do such interesting literary publishing and they do books about literature and film and music all tied in one. They put out records of audiobooks, like LPs. How cool is that? Like there are so many publishers doing interesting work, but it's because they're in Los Angeles. And then they open their own bookstore with unnamed press. And you have these spaces, these alternative literary spaces that we can seek out to find the voices in to try to get them to know that Romanian literature could be for their list too. It doesn't have to be only translation presses, right? If you find a book you're interested in or someone tells you about it, you should be able to do anything. And that the resources of Romanian Cultural Institute are there and, and the interest is there and that we can show a successful partnership to other publishers and say, look, you can step in. Let's do this together um, to be able to bring these books to new audiences. And so that, you know, I, I don't want to talk like I know anything about Romanian literature because it would offend people who do. But um, do I know more than most Americans? Of course. Of course. Right. Of course. But, um, but I, do I feel like it's enough? Of course not. <laughs> we, we started our conversation by talking about establishing a, um, a publishing house in a time uh, uh, when uh, the, uh, the book industry was going through a difficult time. Uh, of course, many, have, many things have changed in the past uh, 10 years. Um, but still, the the book um, uh, the book industry is um, facing difficulties and it's trying to reinvent uh, itself. Like everything else, I would say, in a time where technology has become so uh, disruptive, uh, it's the big game changer. It's uh, transforming uh, businesses and industries overnight. How do you see, you know, because you, you, you had the, the, the courage and the flair to do something against, uh, against um, so much wise, it seemed at the time, advice, <laughs> and, and you succeeded, you succeeded and proved everybody wrong. How do you see the development of the, the book industry in, in the United States, of course? What are you preparing for in the next 10 years of develop? I mean, what, what a great question. I, I, don't, I don't really know if I knew what was coming 10 years ago to get to this point, but maybe we did. I, I think there's going to be a continued um, digitization of publishing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, ebooks are going to, they're, they're a thing now. When we publish a book, we always publish an ebook. I think audiobooks are increasingly important um, to publishers, but for our style of literary fiction, 
audiobooks are not the main driver. People typically only read audiobooks for genre fiction, nonfiction, and very rarely literary fiction. Although we should say there is an audiobook version of Solenoid available. Everyone should download it. It's 35 hours long, which is a delight. So check that out. Um, and we're in talks with someone about doing an audiobook of Femme, which is brand new. I, I didn't even have a chance to tell you before right now. Um, and so we're really hopeful that we can get this audiobook of Femme out with a professional, beautiful voice actress who fell in love with the book and wants to do it herself, which is why we do this, right? <laughs> and so when we when we look ahead, I think um, the technology around ebooks and audiobooks it's just easier to produce them than it's ever been. And so they'll continue to go and grow and that's fine. I think one one interesting thing is that um, book publishing is getting away from traditional large print runs for backlist mm -hmm. books and warehousing towards digital printing. Um, you can basically print one copy of a book now and mail it to someone. Um, and so you don't have the need to warehouse items and ship them traditionally. And I think that that's gonna be an interesting change over the next 10 years. We'll see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. So that literally you could be laying in your bed on a Friday night and order a book and that book will be printed the next day and sent to you by Monday. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. It eliminates a lot of waste in our business. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it disrupts the idea of what a print run is in publishing. And I don't think agents um, are very fond of that. And I don't think that, um, I don't think it's entirely clear what it will mean. I hope that this uh, there's a sort of quiet revolution that's going to happen in terms of paper. There's been massive supply chain shortages over the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, it started with Michelle Obama's autobiography. If you remember that book, it was a very mm -hmm. successful book, mm -hmm. kind of like the Prince Harry book, but it was so successful that it caused a shortage of paper in America. And, um, it, and then at the same time, there were things like strikes at ports in America and the Suez Canal getting blocked and boats um, coming from China filled with books were getting delayed. And as a result, the entire industry went upside down and then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, it made everything go totally sideways. And nowadays, most of the printers that used to do books are now doing Amazon boxes full time. And that's not going to change. And so we have to revolutionize how we get the, um, the physical items to readers. And so I think that we might see a time of more um, increasing like uh, artisanal book production, you could say. Um, like publishers can make the print item very bespoke and special, like a collector's item almost. Uh, but then you get the digital items kind of for free. And we see this in music now, right? People buy LPs, but then they listen to everything on Spotify for the most part. Sure. And uh, I think that that kind of model is coming for publishing. I think it's actually already kind of there. Um, and I think most people treat print books that way. And uh, if you buy a book on our website, you get a free ebook version at the same time. I don't care how you read it, you know, read it whatever way you want, but here you go. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that model is increasingly going to be there for the future. So to that end, that's business stuff. You're asking like maybe 10 years down the line, what about numbers of books translated? I think the number of books translated uh, are going to stay steady. I don't think it's ever going to go up or down in America. It'll fluctuate by 50 to 100 titles a year, which is not enough to move the needle on American readerships understanding less than three percent of all books published right <clears throat> yeah exactly and and that three percent is like all translations that would be like a manual for how to drive a car that was imported from Romania right um what was that funny car you were telling me about while you were here but remember. it's I think uh point eight percent fiction I I think yeah very low mm -hmm. and um and when you do new translations not retranslations of the Russian classics there's more retranslations that come out sometimes than new translations. And so when you break down the numbers, it's pretty bad, right? And you can look at the translation database. Even though the market is huge in comparison to other markets. The market is huge, but uh, there's the same number of, the average number of literary readers for big five books and ours is the same as in, in the Netherlands. And we have 20 times more people than the Netherlands. Um, and so it's a really, our, our print runs are essentially the same as in the Netherlands. The scale is bigger here, but the the actual readership is so distracted. Um, and I think there are a lot of readers, and I think that your average reader would pick up more adventurous books if they were ever marketed at them instead of down to them. People talk down to readers all the time, and um, as if like you work in a like you work in a gas station, you would never understand the literature of Tartarescu. Bullshit! Like that's insane. Like we're gonna get the books to those readers. And like you're a, if you're like a working class writer or if you're like a writer who is 
um, a service worker, or you're on the, uh, what do they call them now? Frontline workers is something we learned from the pandemic. These people are all, we're all on the same reading level. It's just a matter of how we engage with the literature. Because for me, it's my job to engage with literature. But if it's not your job, how do you actually touch books? That's what's going to change is the way that you can market directly to someone. And you don't ever have to talk down to them. You can say, here you are exactly where you are. And so hopefully, we, the one thing I really want to do over the next 10 years, too, is find more readers for Mircha for sci-fi and speculative fiction, because we market really well in the literary world. But I think there are a lot of readers who love adventurous, speculative, and science fiction who have not discovered Solenoid yet, and it's going to blow their minds that people are still writing like this out in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and that's fun, because the book came out last year. We're never going to stop marketing that book. It's a joy, and all, along with all of his other books, along with all the books we've already published. And so the, the work is never done. It just takes on new forms. And so every year, the way that we can use this digital technology, it disrupts things, but it also offers unparalleled opportunities. Uh, and so today we use this digital revolution to be able to be based in Dallas and have access to the market in the same way that the publishers in New York do. Um, that's a big change over where the industry was 40 years ago. Um, and we have so much talent working in publishing in New York, especially that are from Texas. We need to bring them home. We need to bring that talent back to Texas, right? And we need to invest back in the stories of this state because this state's amazing. And uh, the people here are really diverse and into really different things. And the cities are extraordinary. The suburbs are interesting. Like the countryside is mythical and you, you put it all together. How can we do something more with the literature of Texas so that it's in dialogue with things like Romanian literature? You know? I think it's a fantastic note to end our uh, conversation. Um, I'd like to thank you for this uh, extraordinary one hour of uh, conversation. I think everybody has learned a lot from, uh, uh, from, your, uh, from your words, your, from your um, uh, opinions, from your stories about, uh, about your, uh, your success. You have pictured a uh, challenging time ahead for the book industry, but I'm th I think that Deep Vellum is in good hands listening to your uh, your vision for the <laughs> next uh, next years and we develop the Romanian uh, literature is in uh, in very good uh, good hands I'd like to say for the record that even though Romanian Cultural Institute wasn't there during that faithful reading in Dallas uh, some years ago we will never miss any of this uh, <laughs> any of these events um, uh, devoted to a Romanian author and uh, and uh, Romanian books. Our partnership, I'm happy to say, is growing stronger uh, every day. We have had these fantastic um, working relations while uh, preparing and uh, and uh, conducting the, uh, the managing the um, Mircea Cartarescu's tour. Um, I think uh, I think good years are ahead for books in translations and, of course, for Romanian literature. Thank you, uh, Will, and good luck you. with your plans. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Mm -hmm.